I'm thrilled to introduce Lee Alexander. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I, I'm so happy to see all of you. I can't even believe I'm here. This is awesome. Um, and I know it's so hot, so I'll try to make this exciting, maybe? Um, so I'm Lee Alexander. I am a writer and critic about video games, basically. And um, my work focuses on the way that technology interacts with fantasy and play and storytelling and designed interaction, things like that. Um, I write about the games industry, um, which includes the people that make the games and the technology that supports the games. And I also write about um, the culture of their creators and their players, which has been interesting lately. Don't know if you heard. <laughs> I've been doing this for about eight or nine years now. Um, I have an acting degree. I went to two-year conservatory in New York. Um, and I graduated with basically no idea of what I was going to do with my acting degree. So I was, I was an office administrator. And I thought that maybe writing would be a way out. So I started writing. Um, let's see. Yep. Uh, my slides are not going to be very fancy, because if I was still wanted to be making PowerPoints, I would have stayed in offices. So um, bear with me. <laughs> um, let's pretend that my crummy slides are like some kind of rebellion versus my shackled past. Um, so now uh, I am a freelance writer. Um, I tend to combine regular work in the game specialist press with um, writing topical stuff in more mainstream um, publications. And I've also started doing my own ebooks and short stories, like Andy was kind enough to mention. Um, I'd love to tell you about the books in a bit. Um, and sometimes I write about other things besides games, like comics or technology. I mean, it's really tough to follow Darius, because um, Darius is great. I wrote an article about one of Darius's bots for Boing Boing. So I tend to try to combine um, a lot of things that I'm interested in so that I don't feel boxed in. Um, so the market for games writing is really challenging. Um, as you might expect, it's you know, a lot of people want to write about vid play video games all day and write about video games all day. Um, but somehow, I have managed to build up a modest but independent um, life for myself in that space. And um, over the past few years, you know, now I do radio and television sometimes, and I keynote industry conferences, and like a lot of things that sort of suggest to me that I might have even earned some authority in my space somehow. And so, you know, I also started working as a consultant. Um, last year, I co-founded a company called Agency with my colleague, Steve Curran. And we work with game developers to help them gain perspective on their projects and achieve goals and, and improve internal communication. Um, so, of course, I feel really, really lucky as the exception to many rules um, for my field. Um, I make a full-time living freelance. Um, I do it on my own terms as a woman in a space that's traditionally pretty hostile to women. Um, there's an article up today, part two, of how I'm the worst game critic ever. Because, of, yeah, it's funny. I think the uh, author was bragging about it having gotten 1,100 hits. And I, I want to know about his uniques, though. <laughs> um, yeah, so I do non-traditional non work. I write about what I want, and um, I also get to dabble in other projects. That's fortunate. Super lucky. I mean, anyone who gets to go to tech conferences and eat out of food trucks and stay in hotels is really lucky. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, in some ways, if it's not super uncouth to say, there are some ways in which I've made my own luck. Um, uh, so a little history, in case you're not super familiar with the vast and magical world of video games writing. <laughs> um, for the entire time I've been alive, writing on video games has focused mainly on evaluating hardware and software as tech products. Um, the largest addressable audience who reads that stuff, they primarily expect a buyer's guide. They want to know whether they're going to have a good experience or whether they're going to get the value for their dollar and you know that type of thing. Um, they are interested to a certain extent in the people who make games, um, but only to the extent that those people can then make promises to them, the consumers, that the consumers can then hold them accountable for. Um, basically, and they're, they're interested in the industry, but it's in a way that's not dissimilar to team sports, like you know which one is going to win, who makes the best games, who's going to win the console war, that type of thing. Um, but ever since about the time time the millennium turned, some writers began exploring the idea that interactive entertainment is more than tech product, um, that their expressive works 
created by people that they contain or they can provide for um, personal and experiential storytelling, um, people began to maybe consider the idea that video games, or at least some video games, could um, deserve the sort of writing and criticism that um, are often devoted to other more mature media. Um, so these days, uh, the tools for making these things become increasingly democra um, democratic. Um, the platforms on which games are, are played are much more prolific now. And I think, I'd argue, it makes this kind of writing more necessary to help expand definitions and broaden vocabulary and to celebrate independent innovations and to welcome new players and creators um, to the form. Because if you look at what you commonly hear and what you commonly read about video games, to me that doesn't represent the industry that you love. So um, yeah, um, I hope that by doing non-traditional work I can help and play a role in catalyzing um, a different kind of more mature conversation about video games and their role in our culture. Um, so um, that's not something that I would have necessarily began being able to articulate when I started my first Blogspot blog back in 2006, um, sexyvideogameland.blogspot.com. I mean, remember the blog names of the mid-2000s? Um, my blog was full of feelings and thoughts and ideas about the games that I was playing. Um, I wasn't seeing the types of writing that I wanted to read out there. Um, so if I saw it, I thought maybe I could do it as well. Um, so mostly I also thought that if I wrote every day, um, eventually people would notice and I might get a real job writing because that was actually something that happened to bloggers in 2006. Sometimes it is less, uh, you know, it doesn't happen anymore today. So my timing was, was good. Um, even then, though, um, with a lot of the content that I wrote about and the things that I dealt with, I feel like I was probably reacting on an unconscious level um, to the sense that the conversation about video games was dominated by views that I didn't share and by people I didn't have that much in common with. Um, and it was definitely dominated by men. Um, I had a broad and clumsy intent to be subversive that I've, I try to refine, and I continue to refine as time goes on. Um, it's part of my sort of learning process. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, try, I'm trying to start those conversations about women in games, about sex, about adulthood, about maturation, you know, wherever I can. Um, so not long after I started my blog, I actually did get to do full-time work at gaming news sites, writing these blistering headlines. Um, <laughs> I, pay, I did do paying. I wrote about tools, partnerships, and, and technology trends, and, and things like that. Um, I spent time sitting on Activision's financial calls, trying to parse the difference between gap and non-gap revenue for an audience of gamers. Um, <laughs> um, you know, also, um, as a woman, I'm socialized not to toot my own horn, but my friend Courtney said to make sure that I say that I was uh, very prolific at that time, often writing five pieces a day and covering conferences where I could publish articles about talks before the talks were finished. Um, so I said it. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Um, yeah, so um, doing that allowed me to just, it allowed me to earn a living and allowed me to justify investing in personal and experimental writing and in doing stuff that I hoped would actually challenge the conversation around games. Um, it became important to me, even when I had real writing work, to always maintain a blog and a social media presence of my own um, and to be known always as my own voice, not just a byline on a larger site. Um, having um, a readership of my own that shared my values was always much more important to me than having like a full-time job and cultivating that over years has helped allow me my independence now. Um, yeah, as I've said, my main motivation for writing about games was I wanted, I wanted, I want everyone to see games the way that I see them, as beautiful and full of potential. Um, I want to be able to tell somebody about my work and hear them say, yeah, that sounds worthwhile, not like, cool, how's that for you? Yeah, like, you know, they, they look at you like they think you're a creepy arrested child and I don't want, you know, <laughs> like, or, oh, What's that like for you, poor girl? Like, no, I want to change that dialogue a bit. Um, so uh, before long, I was sort of, in my writing early on, pushed into becoming political, almost against my intentions. Um, at the time I started writing, I knew that my gender was a huge novelty to people, but I didn't think it would become an issue um, until, you know, there were, over time and over the years, it became eminently clear to me that the rules and expectations for me and my work, um, and even my tone and my personality and my looks and everything, we're going to be remarkably different for me than for others. I don't fit the normal paradigm of a game journalist. I just don't. Um, and as it slowly sunk in for me, the way that um, women who stand out are often targeted and shut down, it was like I pulled on this little thread 
inside myself. I found a thread and I pulled and I pulled until the entire thing had come apart. And I knew that games were not going to have a healthy creative community or a desirable culture or a meaningful role in the world's media landscape at all until we could address diversity problems um, and inclusivity problems and all these other problems that come from games origin as these hyper-masculine capitalistic technology products. So, um, in addition to regularly writing and speaking about feminism, um, I reject as much as possible conventional models for video games writing. Um, you know, you can't be a female columnist or like a woman who writes her opinions without people making referendums on your personality or speculating about your motives or even your mental health. So I just double down on doing personal work. Um, <laughs> whether I'm doing in interviews, criticism, anything, no pretense of being unbiased. I write about the things I'm interested in, the creators I care about, and the trends that I want to see succeed. Sorry, that's the conspiracy. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Um, I'm absolutely proud, you know, to advance amazing creators and conversations that I think matter to games. Yeah, I have an, I have an agenda, sorry. Um, I did a feature for Nylon Magazine, for example, about Nina Freeman. Uh, she's an independent game developer. She, called, she makes these small games. She calls them vignette games, um, and they're about girlhood, you know, for example. Um, I did a piece for The New Inquiry about Merit Copas's, um Consensual Torture Simulator, which is about consent and embodiment in games, um, and it's a study on violence in games um, in an intimate context. Um, I have a vice column called Understanding Games, which is just stuff I'm thinking about when it comes to mainstream games. Um, and the story that Andy was telling you about was speculative fiction on the Atari dig that was um, written as if I'd gone, kind of, and then I just made up a story about it <laughs> that said what I wanted to say about the event. Um, in general, my approach often puts me at extreme odds with the typical gamer fan type of reader for various reasons. Um, I'm a polarizing figure, um, but I'm thriving even still, despite the fact I've deliberately alienated the traditional audience, somehow I still have a career. That gives me a lot of hope. Um, I think the fact that I often feel so personally about the things that I write about helps me draw support from my own readership. Um, the people who want this I have to believe that the people who want this are as numerous as the number of creepy fanboys who will try to astroturf me um, in order to maintain a status quo whereby they are a target demographic who is explicitly catered to. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel that way as well. <laughs> And of course, I'm far from the only person doing progressive writing these days, which is awesome. I'm part of a community as well. I'm part of a, I feel I'm part of a movement. And the groundswell toward this approach to game making and activism and criticism, it's become so large um, that there are a lot of conversations about how challenging it is to monetize the work, even though the demand is proven. Um, you know, even though I'm still regularly employed by a couple of websites, I'm facing the same economic constraints as anyone who writes for a living. Um, you know, I, uh, I don't really feel like I'm necessarily a candidate for Patreon because I like the way that it's, it's an avenue, f I, I like how it's stepped up to be an avenue for marginalized creators, and I, like I said, I still get work through conventional channels, so I don't necessarily want to unbalance that just yet. Um, I mean, and also I'm, I'm sort of uncomfortable with making my readership my editorship, but that's another conversation. I decided um, to look at alternative content models for myself um, because I want to keep doing my work. Um, it's small, but I, I, th I think it's important. Is it okay to say I think my work is important, or is that bad? Like, <laughs> thank you. Um, I feel strongly about my work. Um, uh, so the Digital Publisher Thought Catalog, they gave, it gave me an advance to do my first book, Breathing Machine, which is a memoir of growing up alongside the early internet and computers and stuff. Um, basically, as soon as I took their money, though, they uh, started like letting their quality bar plummet and uh, publishing transphobic hate speech, which was a really bad situation for me to be in. So. Somebody leaked my book onto the internet, so now instead of giving money to Thought Catalog, there's horrible pirates stealing it. Oops. Um, so, it, <laughs> thank you. That started making me think about self-publishing. Um, so I decided to, to do my second book via Gumroad. This is um, some personal storytelling about my time in the industry through the lens of the annual Game Developers Conference. Um, it's uh, about life and work and people, and um, I thought it would be something industry folks could relate to, but also that outsiders could find interesting, just kind of getting to come in to this space through my eyes and through the eyes of the people that I know. Um, I put it up for sale for $5 or pay what you want. I am so frigging grateful to tell you that most people pay more than $5. I just appreciate my community so, so, so much. Thank you. Um, <laughs> and I've already earned more in one month for this than Thought Catalog paid me for Breathing Machines, so self-publishing is clearly viable. In addition, I can pay someone else with this book. I hired Liz Ryerson, who is one of my favorite games critics, um, artist, musician. She gave me this piece of art for the cover, and she contributed an afterword for the book. I paid 
paid her in advance. I'm now paying her royalties. So not only you know, am I able to you know, help my work continue thriving, but I'm hoping that I can lead a sort of rising tide thing where we all pay our success you know, to someone that we respect. Um, yeah, so I hope uh, my Gumroad storefront will continue to host more short stories and collaborations where every time I publish something, I can pay somebody else. Like, that's kind of my plan. Um, yeah, so uh, I have a big reach. I have as many followers as Cisco, who created the thong song. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, I love the thong song. And like, the day that I got as many followers as, tw as Cisco, like, that was all I needed to feel happy about my life. Um, so, I, this is my, my social media channel is my main avenue for um, pushing my work out to people and sh letting them know it's there. Um, I did a lot of my own promotion, both for Breathing Machine and for, for Clipping Through. Um, so, yeah, um, I'm running a bit over. So, um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, so I, I don't have any magic bullet for this, but the main thing that I want to say is I think that I've been able to succeed independently because people want to support the ideas behind my work and the ideas behind the people that I work with. Um, it's not just about me, it's that, you know, this thing that I'm part of when people buy something from me, they're, they're making that happen. And I think that's an expectation that people have in the new content economy. When you fund something on Kickstarter, it's not just because you want a product, it's because you believe that you're causing something good to happen. Um, and I think that's a pretty good way to look at content creation. Um, so yeah, I'm super grateful to everybody for everything they do for me. And uh, yeah, um, I'm gonna probably say sh share her numbers in the future. I'm sorry, I'm way over time, but... Um, yeah, I look at games as a field that's starting to reach its full potential just now. Um, there will be the mis this visible mainstream arm of the industry uh, and all their consumer technology products forever and their young dude fans, but it's gratifying to feel like there's finally beginning to be a market for other stuff, for more things, for more people, um, and my writing might have a role to play in that. And um, I have a vision of a mature, independent conversation about video games, and I want to reach as many people as I can, and as long as I can keep earning money for this work, I'm going to keep doing it, um, even in the face of resistance from entrenched ideologies. And thank you guys so much for listening to me talk about it. <laughs>